Why is Bengali DNA so unique? That question might sound simple, but behind it lies a story that weaves through ancient migrations, forgotten kingdoms, untold interactions, and the pulse of rivers and mountains. The Bengali people, vibrant and diverse, are the third largest ethnic group on earth. From the misty edges of Assam to the crowded streets of Dhaka, from the poetry of Rabindranath Tagore to the haunting rhythms of Baal songs, there is a reason this land feels ancient, layered, and alive. And it's not just in culture, it's in the blood, it's in the very code of life that flows through the veins of Bengalis. Let's rewind to the very beginning. Long before cities rose, before languages took shape, humans walked out of Africa. Some of them made their way across arid deserts, scaling rocky terrains, finally arriving at the Indian subcontinent tens of thousands of years ago. Among their descendants were the ancestral South Indians, the ASI. These weren't just abstract groups. These were real people whose echoes still live on in the DNA of modern-day Bengalis. They were the first brushstroke on the Bengali genetic canvas, and their presence wasn't isolated. Austroasiatic speakers, Dravidian tribes, and even ancient groups with Negroid features left their mark here too. Bengal didn't just watch history, it absorbed it. Over time, more people arrived. Some walked in through the Northeast, carrying East Asian features, customs, and genes. Others came through the Northwest, bringing Indo-Aryan languages and Vedic traditions. Around 1500 BCE, a significant shift began. Indo-Aryan-speaking groups pushed into the northwestern parts of the subcontinent. With them came new rituals, myths, and cultural currents that would one day morph into what we now recognize as Hinduism. Their genes mixed in, but not as aggressively in Bengal as in places like Punjab or Uttar Pradesh. Instead of being overrun, Bengal adapted. The people adopted the Indo-Aryan language, Bengali, but kept much of their genetic heritage intact. It wasn't conquest. It was more like cultural osmosis. The genes, however, tell a quieter tale. Yes, you can find the R1A1 Y chromosome haplogroup common among Indo-Aryan populations in Bengali men, especially in West Bengal Brahmins. In fact, 72% of West Bengal Brahmins carry it, but that's just one thread. Another haplogroup, R2, is more evenly spread across Bengalis, showing up in both upper and lower castes. Then there's H, L, and J2, each carrying whispers of ancient South Asian roots, Persian merchants, Turkic soldiers, and Silk Road wanderers. It's not a single stream, it's a confluence. As centuries rolled on, Bengal didn't just stay put, it became a bridge between South and Southeast Asia, between Islam and Hinduism, between the mountains and the sea. The Mughals arrived bringing more than just architecture. They brought Persian bloodlines, Central Asian genes, and military elites who married local women. Before them, Turkic and Afghan rulers had already introduced their DNA into the mix. By the 12th century, Arab and Persian traders sailing into Bengal's bustling ports left behind more than goods, they left behind genes. And yet, even with all these influences, the core remained Bengali. When Islam spread through Bengal, it didn't erase the past, it transformed it. Genetic studies show that while there's a detectable West Asian and Arabian component in Bengali Muslims, most of their DNA remains local. Meaning, the Islamic shift in Bengal was more about culture than conquest. People converted, but they didn't vanish. Their genes persisted, unchanged, unshaken. Now let's talk about the sea, the Bay of Bengal. The waves didn't just bring storms, they brought people, traders, explorers, migrants from Burma, Thailand, and beyond. This maritime contact with Southeast Asia left behind subtle traces. Certain mitochondrial DNA haplogroups found in Bengali, women can be linked to these ancient Southeast Asian connections. Especially in eastern Bangladesh, the influence is strong. Here, genes from Austroasiatic Southeast Asians are more pronounced, showing that the East Asian component in Bengali DNA isn't a myth, it's a measurable, visible truth. It gets even more interesting when we look at the maternal side, the mitochondrial DNA. The macrohaplogroup M dominates South Asia, and it's no different in Bengal. Subclades like M2 and M6 show a strong presence, particularly in Bangladesh and along the coasts. Then there's macrohaplogroup R, making up the rest. Within that, 
U2C is especially important in Bengali populations. These maternal lineages tie Bengal to the deep roots of the subcontinent while also offering glimpses of unique regional variation. And if you thought the east-west divide in Bengal was only political, think again. Genetically, there's a gradient, an east-to-west cline. East Bengal, today's Bangladesh, shows more Tibeto-Burman ancestry. The further east you go, the stronger the presence. Areas like Rangpur, Bogra, Rajshahi, and Chittagong display higher levels of East Asian ancestry, its geography meeting genetics. On the flip side, after the partition in 1947, many from East Bengal moved westward, bringing their genes with them. This migration explains why even West Bengal shows a broad variation in East Asian markers. Now let's pause on something powerful, religion. In Bengal, religion divides communities on the surface, but dig deeper, and the genes tell a different story. Bengali Hindus and Muslims are, for the most part, genetically indistinguishable. They share the same ancestors, the same deep roots. A study in the Barak Valley of Assam found almost identical genetic patterns in Hindu and Muslim Bengalis, especially in ABO and RH blood groups. So what does this mean? It means that despite different prayers, customs, and clothing, the DNA remains a constant. It speaks of unity, not division. However, caste does seem to have left a stronger imprint than religion. West Bengal Brahmins, for example, show closer genetic ties to North Indian Brahmins. This suggests that endogamy, marrying within one's caste, helped preserve certain lineages for generations. But outside the upper castes, Bengali DNA is a rich mix, constantly stirred by movement, marriage, and migration. And it's not just history that shapes genes. Sometimes the environment does too. In the Ganges Delta, where the river meets the sea and life dances between floods and droughts, the threat of cholera has always loomed large. Over generations, the people adapted. Genome studies from Bangladesh revealed that certain genes involved in immune response, especially those controlling potassium ion transport and NFQB signaling, are under positive selection. These genes help resist cholera, its evolution at work in real time. Bengalis also show unique patterns in disease susceptibility, genes related to cardiometabolic diseases, breast cancer, liver cancer, even gum disease, have all shown variations in Bengali populations. Some of these could be due to ancient survival adaptations, like storing fat efficiently during times of famine, that now, in the modern era of abundant food, backfire as health risks. It's not just about what genes we carry, but how the world around us has changed. And we haven't even scratched the surface of the Kier gene system, the killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors, linked to immune function. Studies from northern West Bengal show a genetic blend. Dravidian roots, Indo-Aryan markers, even traces of Mongoloid and European ancestry, all of it swirling within a single community, all of it encoded in the invisible alphabet of life. Bengali DNA is a river. It doesn't run straight. It bends, forks, loops back, and flows into the sea. Its uniqueness comes not from purity, but from complexity, from being a meeting point a melting pot, a mosaic of ancient travelers, local survivors, and global drifters. It is, in every sense of the word, a legacy, and this legacy continues to shift, to evolve. Because DNA isn't a museum piece, it's alive, breathing, reacting to the world, just like the people of Bengal, ever-changing, ever-resilient, ever-proud. The story deepens when we consider the geographical role of Bengal, Sandwiched between the towering Himalayas and the restless Bay of Bengal, this region has always been more than just a landmass. It's been a passageway, a corridor through which humans have moved, settled, traded, and transformed. The Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, with its endless rivers and fertile plains, didn't just grow rice, it grew civilization. The terrain made it easy to enter, difficult to dominate, and perfect for mixing. From ancient times to modern migrations, Bengal has been absorbing influences, folding them into its cultural and genetic identity. That's why Bengali DNA isn't linear. It's circular, recursive. You find loops of ancestry from Southeast Asia interwoven with deep South Asian roots. You see echoes of Central Asia, whispers of Arabia, fragments of the Caucasus. It's like standing in a crowded room full of stories where every voice matters and somehow all those voices speak through the genes of a modern-day Bengali. 
And it's not just about ancestry, it's also about variation within the Bengali identity. The average Bengali person in Dhaka may have a different ancestral blend than someone from Siliguri. Someone from Chittagong may carry more East Asian influence than someone from Nadia. The diversity is layered. In some districts of Bangladesh, like Rangpur and Rajshahi, you find higher levels of East Asian ancestry, a genetic shadow cast by ancient Tibeto-Burman migrations and trade with Burmese kingdoms. In contrast, in parts of West Bengal, due to waves of post-partition resettlement, the genetic signature becomes more of a patchwork, a mingling of local genes with those carried over from the East. Even within these regions, there are micro-histories, communities that stayed isolated, tribes that married within themselves, villages that welcomed outsiders, cities that became melting pots. Every factor, religion, caste, trade, colonization, etched subtle marks into the genome. And yet, underneath all these differences, the shared foundation remains unmistakably Bengali. This shared foundation is often seen in the dominant Y-DNA and mitochondrial haplogroups. The presence of haplogroup R1A1 in West Bengal Brahmins tells one story of Indo-Aryan male lineages that held strong in certain groups. But the presence of R2, H, and L across the general population whispers of older, deeper roots. The J2 haplogroup linked to ancient Middle Eastern farmers and traders shows how far the tendrils of interaction reached. On the maternal side, macrohaplogroups M and R paint a picture of continuity, of women whose lineages stretch back tens of thousands of years within the subcontinent, passed down from mother to daughter like a sacred inheritance. Zooming out, you begin to see Bengal as a genetic epicenter, not because it's isolated, but because it's connected connected to the northeast via ancient jungle trails and rivers, connected to the west via trade routes and empires, connected to the sea via maritime exchanges with Southeast Asia and beyond. These connections didn't just influence food, dress, or religion. They shaped the very genome of the people who call this land home. Let's revisit the ancient Austroasiatic connection. Long before Indo-Aryans came down with Sanskrit and sacrificial fire rituals, Austroasiatic-speaking tribes were already living in eastern India. Their descendants survive in today's tribal populations, but their genetic impact lingers far wider. In rural Bangladesh and some indigenous communities, their mitochondrial markers are still present, reminding us that Bengali identity isn't a modern invention. It's a palimpsest, with older layers peeking through the newer ones. And what about the role of colonialism? The British Empire ruled Bengal for nearly two centuries, and while they left behind political and economic scars, their genetic imprint is less pronounced. Unlike earlier conquerors like the Turks, Mughals, or Afghan dynasties, the British presence did not lead to widespread intermarriage or integration. Their influence was bureaucratic, not biological. Still, in coastal cities like Kolkata and Chittagong, small traces remain, isolated surnames, occasional Eurasian features, faint echoes of a colonial past. One can't talk about Bengali DNA without confronting the emotional upheaval of partition. In 1947, as the British left and the Indian subcontinent was carved into India and Pakistan, Bengal was split. East Bengal became East Pakistan, later Bangladesh. West Bengal stayed in India. This partition triggered one of the largest human migrations in history. Millions crossed borders, families split, identities fractured, and through it all, genes moved. Communities that had lived in the same place for centuries were uprooted. In the process, new combinations were born. East Bengal ancestry entered Kolkata. West Bengal genes seeped into Dhaka. The political line didn't erase the genetic unity. It merely redrew its geography. But while the DNA stayed connected, New cultural differences began to evolve. Language shifted subtly. Food, clothing, even gestures changed. Religion took on sharper roles in daily life. Still, the genes told a different story, one of common origin, not division. Another fascinating dimension is how historical trade routes brought subtle, almost imperceptible gene flow into Bengal. Arab traders docked at Chittagong centuries ago. Some married locals, leaving behind a trace of Arabian ancestry. Armenian merchants once settled in Kolkata. Their numbers were small, but their presence marked another chapter in the genetic diary of the region. Bengal didn't just absorb major invasions, it absorbed the quiet drifters, the forgotten travelers, the unknown lovers. 
Modern genetic studies now allow us to zoom in on specific patterns. The potassium ion transport genes under selection in Bangladeshis show an adaptation to the local environment, particularly to waterborne diseases like cholera. These aren't tea just dry scientific facts. They tell us that the people of Bengal didn't tea just survive their environment. They adapted to it at the genetic level. Their DNA became a reflection of their landscape, resilient, responsive, resilient again. Other studies have found links between certain gene polymorphisms and diseases more common among Bengalis, like certain cancers and heart conditions. There is evidence to suggest that a tendency toward insulin resistance or cardiovascular disease could be the result of ancient adaptations to scarcity, an evolutionary trick that helped ancestors store fat during famine, but now in the age of abundance becomes a liability. Genes that once saved lives may now shorten them. It's a cruel irony, but one that biology knows well. One particularly interesting area of research involves the immune system. The KIR gene cluster mentioned earlier isn't just a quirky marker. It plays a role in how the body fights off infections, viruses, and perhaps even how it handles pregnancy. The Bengali population shows unique patterns in this cluster, reflecting its deep genetic mixture. This kind of variation could lead to medical breakthroughs, particularly in personalized medicine, if we understand it better. Even blood types tell a tale. Studies on ABO and RH groups among Bengali populations have found similarities between communities that, on the surface, seem divided by religion or caste. Again and again, the science brings us back to the same conclusion. Bengali diversity is real, but its unity is deeper. Through it all, the Bengali genome continues to shift. With urbanization, intermarriage, and global migration, today's Bengalis are becoming even more genetically diverse. Some move to London, some to New York, others to the Middle East. They carry with them the silent record of millennia, now mixing with other diasporas. Future generations will carry traces of Bengal in Tokyo and Toronto and Cairo and Cape Town, but even as new layers form, the older ones don't disappear. They live on, in mitochondrial markers, in linguistic quirks, in the tilt of an eye, the shape of a jaw, the rhythm of a folk song sung during a festival. DNA is not destiny, but it is memory. And Bengali DNA remembers. It remembers the Dravidian footfalls in the forests. The Austroasiatic prayers whispered into the wind. The Indo-Aryan hymns echoing through riverbanks. The Mughal banners flying over forts. The Arab call to prayer floating across villages. The British gunboats on the Hooghly the tears of partition, the dreams of independence. All of it recorded not in books, but in the double helix of every Bengali child born today. So the next time someone asks, what makes Bengali DNA so unique? You'll know the answer isn't a simple one. It's a thousand stories layered on top of one another, told through molecules and migration. It's not just about who came and went, but about who stayed, who adapted, who loved, and who endured.